In two weeks time, Falcon Heavy will be flying for the first time in three years. We'll be taking a look at that and the upcoming first orbital launch from the UK in Monday's Tomorrow Space News. As always, let's head down to South Texas with the start of the SpaceX update and have a look at what Starship development has been happening over the past week. Here's a ship aft skirt which is sitting on the structural test stand. The hat isn't strapped into the base, but when it is, it pulls down, recreating the structural loads experienced at max Q. Over the various static fire tests that Ship 24 has performed, it's always lost a few thermal tiles here and there. These are obviously very useful when re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and before the ship is stacked onto Booster 7, it's important that these gaps are patched up. Speaking of Super Heavy Booster 7, it was rolled out last Friday for what we believe is the final time, pending no damage requiring a rollback to High Bay 2. This means that this should be the final time we ever see B7 rolling down the highway. The next time it leaves the production site, it'll be under its own power, with a ship on top heading for orbit. Testing your ground service equipment, no matter how weird and wacky it is, is extremely important and SpaceX has continued this by giving the chopsticks a jiggle. They've also been testing out the ship quick disconnect, which extends into the aft end of the ship and then retracts at liftoff, hopefully a bit quicker than what was being demonstrated here. It is in the name, quick disconnect. There's also been an interesting development at SpaceX's facility in McGregor with a firing which looks and sounds nothing like a Merlin, Raptor or Super Draco. It's being speculated that this could be a thruster for the lunar human landing system variant of Starship. And we do know from the renders that the landing burn will be completed by engines high up on the fuselage. If you have any creative ideas, do leave them in the comments. Falcon Heavy will soon hopefully be flying again with the USSF-44 mission. And boy, has it been a while. The last time Falcon Heavy flew, this hadn't happened yet. Nothing Starship related had flown yet. Starhopper feels like decades ago now in Starbase terms. This flight is extremely overdue. The launch mount at 39A has been getting converted over the past few days from Falcon 9 to Falcon Heavy, following on from the Crew 5 launch, which we'll be covering in space traffic at the end of the show. This is in preparation for a net launch date of October 28th, which is just over two weeks away from the time of this episode's release. Being a US Space Force mission, we know very little about this flight. All we really know is that it has been delayed several times since its initial launch date of the end of 2020. The most exciting part of any Falcon Heavy flight though is still happening and that's the double booster landing. Originally, this was going to be a double drone ship landing out to sea, but it's been amended to a double return to launch site. Expect lots of cheering and two triple sonic booms. Falcon Heavy launches are also expected to ramp up over the coming months, with six planned over the next year, including the next Space Force mission, USSF-67, and the one after that, USSF-52. Whether or not NASA's Psyche mission will be able to make the July launch window will be announced shortly, which will be helpful news to hear either way, considering yours truly is still slated to go and cover that launch for you lovely people. I feel like there is just something about Falcon Heavy which makes space nerds go bonkers. Even though we have absolutely no idea what the payload is, I'm still super excited for this flight and if you clicked on this video I think there's a strong chance you are too. This is the first of three times where 5G will pop up in this episode with SpaceX announcing current plans to use part of the KU band for 5G will interfere with Starlink ground terminals more than they previously thought. According to the company, Starlink will be unusable for most Americans if 5G services are allowed to operate within the 12 GHz band, and that's because SpaceX uses the 12 GHz band to connect the satellites in low Earth orbit to the user terminals. The satellite broadcaster DISH network is currently on the opposite end of SpaceX's argument as they're seeking permission from the Federal Communications Commission to use the 12 GHz band for television use and terrestrial 5G. According to them, SpaceX's claims about most Americans being cut off from Starlink are exaggerated. According to SpaceX, however, DISH's studies are inaccurate because they've been based on incorrect assumptions about the Starlink network. 
Starlink competitor OneWeb has taken SpaceX's side on the conundrum as they've submitted their own study to the FCC showcasing how their services would be disrupted as well. Whichever direction the FCC decides to rule, it seems like someone is not going to be happy, so it'll be dependent on whether or not the FCC sees more importance in satellite internet or terrestrial 5G. SmallSat launch provider Virgin Orbit's next launch is technically ready according to the company, however, they're still waiting for a launch license from the Civil Aviation Authority. Even though they already have a launch license from the FAA for United States operations, because this flight, which could be known as Start Me Up, is originating from UK soil, the company needs a license from the UK's Aviation Authority. The scheduled date for launch is now dependent on when that license comes through, but according to the CEO Dan Hart, the CAA are driving forwards with the approval. The rocket and support equipment are being prepared for shipping, with a previously rumoured launch date of October 29th. That now seems unrealistic though, because once the equipment reaches Spaceport Cornwall in Newquay, it still needs to be set up and integrated. There is a date internally which the company are aiming for, and we should be hearing that publicly over the next few days, so do keep your eyes peeled for that. The payloads on board this mission are from the UK, US, Poland and Oman, and they'll be heading to a 550km sun-synchronous orbit, hopefully very soon. Cosmic Girl has already ventured east to Fort Lauderdale in preparation for the transatlantic crossing. It landed at Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport at 21.13 last night, local time. Capstone, the small sat launched back in June which is scouting out the near rectilinear halo orbit that NASA's Lunar Gateway is set to fly, has been taken out of safe mode and is now operating normally once again. Back on the 8th of September, a valve in one of the reaction control thrusters was jammed partially open, meaning that whenever the system was pressurised, it would produce thrust. This couldn't be counteracted by the reaction wheels, pushing Capstone into a spin. So, as they always do, the engineers worked on a plan to try and stop capstone spinning. They ran simulations and tests on the spacecraft before sending commands last Friday to try and recover the satellite. They worked, and capstone now has full three-axis control once again, allowing it to point its antennas back to Earth and orient its solar panels towards the Sun. The mission team are going to be working on possible fixes for this sticky valve to try and reduce the risk of it getting in the way during future manoeuvres. The lunar insertion burn on November 13th is still go, which will place Capstone into the aforementioned near rectilinear halo orbit. Once there, its purpose is to verify the stability of an NRHO, making sure it is suitable for the Gateway Space Station. To say it has been a busy week of launches would be a monumental understatement, and we're going to start with a commercial payload on an Atlas V. Rarely do we see commercial customers pick this vehicle, but at 2136 UTC on the 4th of October from Slick 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, this 531 configurated Atlas V carried SES-20 and SES-21 for, you guessed it, SES. These two satellites are communication satellites for the C-band spectrum and they'll be replacing former SES satellites which operated in the lower 300, upper 200 MHz spectrum which will no longer be useful with the deployment of 5G. The following day on October 5th at 1657 seconds UTC precisely from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, SpaceX launched NASA's Crew-5 mission with Commander Nicole Mann, the first Native American woman to go to space, pilot Josh Kasada, and mission specialists Koichi Wakata and Anya Kikina, who is the first Russian to fly on an American vehicle since 2002. This mission was also special as it was the debut flight of the latest Falcon 9 booster to enter the family, B1077. This booster though didn't stay sparkly white clean for long as it successfully landed on the drone ship just read the instructions and it is now awaiting its next assignment. Between the launch and docking of Crew-5, SpaceX managed to sneak in another Starlink flight just because they could. At 2310 UTC the same day, October 5th, Group 4 Mission 29 was launched from Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. On board were 52 Starlink satellites which were placed into their initial 315 by 306 km, 53.22 degree low Earth orbits and over the coming months they'll be raising themselves to a final 540 km circular orbit. This mission was supported by B1071, which has only ever flown from the west coast. It successfully touched down on Of Course I Still Love You, about 650 kilometers downrange in the Pacific Ocean, off the coast of Baja California. Support ship NRC Quest is expected to have picked up this flight's fairings.
After a 29 hour wait, Crew Dragon Endurance docked to the forward port on the Harmony model at 2101 UTC on the 6th of October. This is the capsule's second venture to the orbiting laboratory and it's planned to stay here for 145 days before undocking and returning to Earth next February. On Friday, the 7th of October, at 13.10 Universal Time, China launched this Long March 11 from a barge in the Yellow Sea. On board was Centi Space 1 S5 and Centi Space 1 S6, which were successfully delivered to their low Earth orbits. The same day, at 17.09 UTC, Rocket Lab were flying once again for a personal record-breaking eighth time this year. This Electron was launching the It Argos Up From Here mission, carrying General Atomics Gazelle satellite to a 750km sun-synchronous orbit from Launch Complex 1B on the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. Not a lot is known about Gazelle, apart from the fact that it is a satellite bus for science payloads such as Argos 4 and Radmon, which were flown on this mission. Guess what? It's another SpaceX launch. This time though, it wasn't a Starlink, it was the launch of Intelsat's Galaxy 33 and Galaxy 34 satellites, which were launched at 2305 UTC on October 8th from Slick 40 at the Cape. Just like with the SES sats launched earlier in the week by Atlas V, these satellites will be used to help clear up the part of the C-band spectrum which is utilised by 5G. This flight is notable for two reasons, firstly this incredible shot from a shortfall of Gravitas during the jellyfish hours, and secondly the booster supporting this mission, B1060, joined the 14 flights come becoming one of the two fleet leading boosters which SpaceX is operating. It of course touched down on the aforementioned drone ship, with support ship Bob scooping up the fairings. China was launching yet again this week with the Advanced Spaceborne Solar Observatory being launched on this Long March 2D at 2343 UTC on October 8th from Site 9401 at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center. Abbreviated to ASOS, this observatory is designed to study the interaction of the Sun's magnetic field, coronal mass ejections and solar flares. With all the launches over the last seven days, it's not surprising that Russia would get in the mix as well. On October 10th at 0252 UTC, the 17th GLONASS-K1 Global Positioning Satellite was launched on a Soyuz 2.1B from Site-434 at the Blizetsk Cosmodrome in Russia. This satellite comes in at around 750 kilos and it'll end up at a 19,100 km medium Earth orbit at an inclination of 64.8 degrees. I haven't been able to obtain video of this launch as of yet, so what you're looking at right now is a GLONASS M launch from 2020. It's a slightly less hectic week coming up with RAISE 3 on an Epsilon from JAXA, ANGOSAT 2 on a rare Proton M from Russia, and HOTBIRD 13F on a Falcon 9 from the Cape. Thank you to everyone who is a citizen of tomorrow. This lovely bunch contribute anywhere from a smidge to a sizable amount once a month, helping to keep us on the air. If you want to experience some epic perks for yourself, such as being able to hang out in our post live show member exclusive hangouts, head to join.tomorrow.tv today. That's not it for this week, as there's still some things to come on tomorrow. Dr. Tamitha Scove will be back on Wednesday with another space weather update. We'll be back on Friday for our weekly live show and then I'll be back next Monday with more news. Thanks for watching today's episode. Hopefully we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Oh. Oh. Oopsies.